You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now present Your Life is Worth Living, hosted by Al Smith. Welcome to this week's edition of Your Life is Worth Living, Reflections from the Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. For over 50 years, Archbishop Sheen captivated audiences on both radio and television. Millions tuned in each week to hear his messages of hope and encouragement. On this week's broadcast, we will share a few of those reflections with you. And so we'd encourage you to sit back and relax and enjoy one of the greatest communicators of our time, the Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Hello, Radio Maria family, and welcome to another edition of Your Life is Worth Living. I'm your host, Al Smith, and I want to thank you for joining me for a few Lenten reflections given by the Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. We are in the season of Lent, and hopefully your Lenten observances are going well. Your prayer, your almsgiving, all those little special things we do each and every Lent. And again, we're uh, praying that you will have a successful Lent, that you will have a good um, outcome, I'd like to say. Uh, I know a lot of times we all experience Lent, and when Easter comes, we kind of have a little bit of remorse saying, I could have done more. I could have prayed more. I could have made more sacrifices. So hopefully you'll have no regrets. This will be the best Lent you have ever had. And uh, the fact that you're with us to listen to the Venerable Sheen uh, is a good sign. It's a good sign. So now we're going to continue on our series of meditating on the seven last words. Our Lord spoke from the cross. And we will have Bishop Sheen share the seventh word from the cross. And uh, that uh, talk is entitled, Do I Have Any Scars? And then he'll follow it up with a reflection entitled, The Enduring Freshness of the Wounds of Christ. There's something to be said about our Lord and how even in his resurrection, he kept the wounds, the wounds that he endured uh, from his crucifixion and his death on the cross. And so uh, we'll look forward to that. So let us begin with prayer, as we always do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please enjoy this reflection now entitled, Do I Have Any Scars? In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we read a description of Christ as the Lamb slain, as it were, from the foundation of the world. slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, just as soon as God made the world and gave man freedom, he knew that he would have to pay the price and send his son to save us. So by intent, by plan, therefore, at the very beginning of creation, Christ is pictured as already slain. Now we come to history. Abraham is chosen as the father of the Jews. And testing his obedience, God asks him to sacrifice his only son Isaac. This is a symbol of the heavenly father asking his son to sacrifice himself. And Isaac has the wood laid upon his shoulder. 
And he and his father journey up to the top of the mountain where the father is prepared to offer his son in sacrifice. Isaac does not know it. Taking the wood off his shoulders as if it were a kind of a cross, he says to the father, where is the lamb? There is a lamb to be sacrificed. Abraham answered, God will provide. Just at the moment that Abraham raised his knife to slay his son, an angel stayed it, and the sacrifice was found nearby in the bushes and offered up. But that question of Isaac was caught up from the top of that mountain, and every breeze that ever blew over Israel and over Judea carried that message. And for centuries, everyone heard it. Where is the Lamb? Where is the Lamb? When Pharaoh refused to let the people of Israel go, God told them to kill a lamb and to take the blood and sprinkle it in the form of a cross over the doorposts, not on the floor because blood is sacred. It remits sin and it is not to be walked on. And the destroying angel that would slay the firstborn of all the Egyptians, man and beast, would spare anyone that was in that house that was marked with the blood of the Lamb. The Israelites began their march, and the question was still asked, where is the Lamb? Josephus, a Jewish historian, tells us that there were about 250,000 lambs offered every year by the Jewish people in the temple. Every family had to provide a lamb. If they were poor, 20 could unite and offer a lamb. But the lamb had to be sacrificed. And after this question had been wafted down through the centuries, one day John the Baptist is preaching at the Jordan. Crowds gathered to hear him, many to be baptized, as he preached the rather hard gospel of laying the axe to the root of the tree. And as he looks over his crowd, he sees one man who attracts his attention. And all the while in the desert meditations there had been this question, where is the lamb, where is the lamb? And now he looks up and he says to his people, there's the lamb! Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb had come. And now on this Good Friday afternoon, down below the hill of Calvary in the temple of Jerusalem, one could hear the bleating of thousands of sacrificed lambs. Have you ever noticed there's been no sacrifice of a lamb since Good Friday? The lamb has come. And now the lamb is being sacrificed and he has completed his work. And just as planets, after a long period of time, complete their orbit, and come back again to their starting point, as if to salute him who sent them on their way. So he now returns to the Father. He had been in the hands of men too long. Whenever he used that expression, 
It was not very complimentary. He often said that he would be delivered into the hands of men. We do not treat our Creator too gently. Now we can go into other hands. So he prepares his last words. Death is not coming to him. He goes out to meet it. Because he will be raised from the dead in three days. Death is the last of the shackles that he had to break. You see, we were slaves. So he became a slave. He made the Emancipation Declaration and he broke all the shackles, just symbols of them, sickness, deafness, leprosy, one shackle after another. And the one shackle that bound us and the last enemy of all was death. So now he has to snap that last cord so that he will have conquered everything that flowed from Satan. And he says his last words with a loud voice. All the Gospels note that. It was not done from weakness. It was done from power. It was the cry of victory. Father, he says first. Abba, Abba, Father. The Jews treated God with a magnificent delicacy. In fact, they would had two words for God. One word they would not use. It was too holy. When our blessed Lord came and spoke of God as being his Father, the Father and I are one. Can you imagine how scandalized they were? But more so when our Lord began using an Aramaic word, which is called a caritative word. It was a word that was used by children in the family for the father. Abba. That might have meant, well, daddy, something like that. But a very familiar word. Now that's the word our Lord uses of his father. Abba. One in nature. Into thy hand. I commend my spirit. I project it. I send it out. He breathed out his spirit. This was the first of the breathings of the spirit of Christ. Upon Mary who symbolized the church, John, the disciples of the church. He breathed out his spirit. There's a rupture of a heart to a rapture of love. And we will not come to the conclusion. But we will picture the centurion. But in order to break the legs of the two who were also crucified with our Lord, because no dead body could hang on a cross after sunset. So they smashed and hacked the legs of the others, but... Our blessed Lord, already having commended his spirit to the Father, his body was untouched. The lamb had to be unblemished. No bone of the lamb, Paschal lamb, could ever be broken. The prophecy is fulfilled. As the centurion now takes a sword, or a lance, and thrusts it into the side of Christ, In the first open heart surgery of the world, my dear centurion, there's an easier way to his heart than that. Although we've taken the same route ourselves. Blood and water comes forth. 
blood, the price of redemption, water, the symbol of our sanctification. And he makes the declaration of faith. Indeed, this is the Son of God. Now in this panorama of history, five years from now, one of the learned, most learned of the Jews, Saul, who was trained under Gamaliel, starts persecuting the church, sets out for Damascus to seize the members of Christ's body there. Now remember that Christ in this time is glorified in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And Saul, on the way to Damascus, hears a voice, Saul! Saul! Why are you persecuting me? Not why have you. Why are you doing it now? How could Christ be persecuting Saul, our Lord? Our Lord's in heaven, glorified. Saul is only touching the members of the church because the church is Christ's body. That's the reason. Church is Christ. So, if someone steps on your foot, your head complains. Saul was touching part of the church, and the head complained. Christ and the church are one. It was the Lamb that was speaking from heaven. St. John, who was at the foot of the cross at the end of his life, exiled on Patmos, now writes the last and mysterious book of Scripture, the book of Revelation, in which he pictures the coming of Christ on the last day. For there will be what John Donne calls the world's last night. And as our Lord told Caiaphas, he said, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven to render to everyone according to his works. And St. John, now having a vision of heaven and the Lamb, pictures the Lamb coming again on the last day to judge us. And all will see him even those who have pierced him. He will come bearing the same scars that he showed to Thomas on hands and feet and side. Hands. Hands that broke bread to signify his own broken body Hands that ministered bread to the starving. Hands that laid themselves on the heads of little children. Hands that touched lepers. Hands that were calloused in the carpenter shop. Feet. Feet the mother worried about as they pattered over lumber and nails and hammers and brought her visions of a man who would be put to death by his own profession. Feet that Magdalene would wash. Feet before which the Syrophoenician woman 
threw herself in petition and love. And the scar on the heart, large enough for a hand, Our Lord said to Thomas, put your hand into my side. So when this lamb comes, bearing these sons, as it were, on hands and feet and side, we will all see the scars. We will be judged by them. And will say, show me your hands. Have they been scarred from giving? Are they scarred in service? Are they scarred in labor? Are they scarred in relieving the cares of feverish brows? Have they been scarred in giving food to the hungry? For I was hungry, they gave me to eat. Show me your feet. Have they gone on missions? Have they helped missionaries? Have they gone about doing good? Have they often made a track down in the middle aisle of a church to visit the Eucharistic Savior? Have they ever wandered to the feet of a crucifix? Show me your side. Is it scarred? Thank God mine is. Scarred in pain out of love for him? Has the heart been scarred in love? Not in need love, just loving only to be satisfied? Scarred in a gift love? Is the side scarred from thinking about my passion and my death? that you may glory in my resurrection. This is the way you'll be judged. Hands and feet and side. Little girl said to her mother one day, Mommy, how did your hands get that way? How did you get so ugly? Oh, my dear child, when you were a little baby, a house caught fire. And I thought of only one thing. And I ran upstairs, and your cradle was aflame. And I threw off all the blankets. And I pulled you out from the fire which blazed about my face and my hands. And I saved your life. That's why my hands are that way. Oh, she said, Mommy, I love your scars. So if we love our scars, seated as you are, you will recite after me as we conclude the act of contrition. Oh, my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all of my sins because I dread the loss of heaven 
and the pains of hell. But most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all of my love, I firmly resolve, with the help of thy grace, to confess my sins, to do penance, and amend my life. Amen. Bye, and God love you. You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now continue with the program, Your Life is Worth Living, hosted by Al Smith. Hello, Radio Maria family, and welcome once again to another edition of Your Life is Worth Living. I hope you enjoyed that first reflection entitled, Do I Have Any Scars? And it was nice to do the act of contrition at the end of that uh, broadcast. Uh, We need to uh, spend a little bit of time each day doing an examination of conscience, and so it is nice to have Bishop Sheen lead us in prayer. And so now we will continue with his Lenten meditations, and this next one is entitled, The Enduring Freshness of the Wounds of Christ. Please enjoy. The meditation during this holy hour will be on the enduring freshness of the wounds of Christ. We are too apt to think of the passion of Christ as completed and finished. It is an enduring thing. In the book of Revelation, St. John, in the fifth chapter, writes, Then I saw standing in the very middle of the throne inside the circle of living creatures and the circle of the elders, a lamb with the marks of slaughter upon him. In heaven, John sees a lamb with the marks of slaughter upon him. Throughout his gospel, John always uses the Greek word amnos for lamb. Here in the book of Revelation, he uses another word, arneon, which means a pet lamb, a domesticated lamb, one that belonged to the family. the lamb with the marks of slaughter upon him. But before we come to his enduring passion, we recall of the historical one. What answer can we give, or what consolation, to someone in a concentration camp? To a mother with several children, she dying of cancer. A bereavement. What solace do we bring? What is the answer to the problem of evil? There is no rational answer. The Old Testament comes close to it in the book of Job. Here is a man who is good, wealthy, And Satan asks God to tempt him. So Satan sometimes is the cause of many of the ills of good people. And God said, you may touch his flesh, but you may not touch his soul. And poor Job loses all of his flock, all of his children, and the only thing that God leaves him is Mrs. Job. And she was to heighten his trial, for she said, Curse God and die. The consolers come, or rather the counselors, three of them. And they give every explanation possible to Job. Job is not satisfied with them, and Job asks questions. Why was I born? Why was I ever nestled at my mother's breast? 
Why did I ever see the light of day? And God appears. Now, if God were a Broadway dramatist, he would have answered all of the questions of Job and made the answers click. But what does God do? God asks Job questions. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Upon what are its bases ground it? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? Where is the hiding place of darkness? Out of whose womb came the ice? The frost from heaven? Hast thou gendered it? Canst thou make the evening star to rise upon the children of men? Canst thou send forth thy voice, and will thunders and lightnings go forth and come back to thee and say to thee, Here we are? And when God finished asking Job questions, Job understood that the questions of God were more satisfying than the answers of men. As a mouse-eating piano keys could not understand why anyone should sit at a stool and play Tchaikovsky, so the human mind could not comprehend God's ways. But God did say to Job about the counselors, and let that always be a lesson to them. God said, offer some sacrifices to make up for their stupid answers. But there was no answer to the question of evil until, until the good Lord came down from heaven. He broke through this world of sin and evil. He entered into it and made it a part of himself, identified himself with evil. Sinless, he was nevertheless made sin. And when he came into it, the world was asking such questions as, Does God know anything about pain? Does God know anything about a migraine headache? as if his head were crowned with thorns. Does God know anything about those that are brought into the accident wards of hospitals? Does God know anything about being a castaway and a refugee in another land? Does God know anything about being in a prison? Does God know anything about the gaping wounds of battlefields? Does God know anything about hunger? Did he ever go without food for three days or four or five? Yes, God knows what it is to have a migraine headache. God knows what it is to have a wound such as a wound that is seen in an accident ward. God knows the evil. He identified himself with it, like that Jewish girl, the Nazi guard during the Nuremberg trial, said that he was sent in to burn hundreds of Jewish bodies, all naked and dead. And when he went to set fire, he saw in their midst one body clothed, that of a young girl, about 18 who are you? I'm a Jewess from Salonika. What are you doing here? She said, did you think that I could live when all my people are dying? So this is the only answer that there is to the problem of evil. There's no other. Our Lord took it upon himself. Which means that as his priest victims, we have to do the same, as we will see later on. We are carrying on his work. He was sinless. 
But he was made responsible for all the sins of the world and was numbered with the transgressors. Now the full consciousness of this evil began when he went into the garden of Gethsemane. This was perhaps the moment of the greatest mental suffering of our blessed Lord. Perhaps more terrible than the cross. For here he takes upon himself human guilt. Now it's rather difficult for our poor mortal minds to understand the mystery of God being besmirched with human sin in the garden. Perhaps we can approach it this way. An animal does not suffer as much pain as we think. Because for an animal, each moment of pain is distinct. For us humans, however, we think back in the past and we say, Oh, I've had this pain for six months. And we drag all of that past agony up to the present moment. And then we look into the future and we say, I will suffer for this for five years more. And we drag that future. So that in this concentrated moment, where the past, the present, and the future meets, there is intense human agony. That is one of the reasons why when we visit the sick, we try to break the continuity of their pain. Now, when our Lord is in the garden, he was not suffering so much from pain as from evil. And remember that only the innocent know what sin is. We can become so feverish that we think that we are well. Only the sinless really know guilt. So our Lord now reaches back into the past, not thinking of the pains that he has endured since he put on this mortal frame, but he drags up to the present moment all the sins of the world. The sin of Adam. Cain was there, purple in the sheet of his brother's blood. The abominations of Sodom and Gomorrah were there. The coarseness of the Jews that taught sometimes even greater coarseness to the Gentiles. All those sins and abominations and idolatries were there. And then with his infinite mind looking into the future, dragging back upon himself and in the present moment all of the sins that would ever be committed until the end of time. Sins that rent Christ's mystical body. Sins of the old who should have passed the age of sinning. Sins of the young for whom the heart of Christ is tenderly pierced. Sins committed in the city in the city's fetid atmosphere of sin. Sins committed in the country that made all nature blush. Sins too awful to be mentioned. Sins too terrible to be named. Sin, sin, sin. And Samson, like, he reaches up and pulls down this horrible edifice of sin upon himself until the blood begins to pour out from his body forming on the olive roots, red drops, the first red beads in the rosary of redemption. He needed consolation. Three times he goes back to find his chosen ones asleep. Can you not stay awake one hour with me? This bloody sweat is beyond our compass. But I once was a director of a nun 
who spent many years in China. When the communists came in, she was tortured in an unbelievable way in jail, beaten, scourged, finally released. And I saw her not very long ago, and she said, I'm suffering from the stigmata, not the mystical stigmata. But stigmata is a medical disease. The doctors tell me that there are six persons in the United States who have the stigmata, the medical stigmata. She said, at any moment, I could burst out and shed blood. I do not know when it is coming. There's never any advance notice. It could break out in my arms and my leg, any part of my body or my face. And I said, do the doctors have any explanation for this? And they said, you must have gone through a tremendous psychological trauma. It was what she had suffered in China that produced this. Maybe this is some dim intimation of what our blessed Lord suffered when he took our guilt upon himself. Then he is arrested. And there are two trials, a civil trial and an ecclesiastical trial. The civil trial of Pilate and Herod, the church trials of Annas and Caiaphas. The church finds him a little too divine. It very often does. Are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? Thou hast said it with thy own lips, I am. He's blasphemed. He's made himself God. Then, in the civil trial, he's too human. Too mixed up in politics. Too concerned with the world. He's been perverting the nation, refusing to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he's Christ, a king. Too unworldly, too worldly, too divine, too human. What is a fitting punishment for one condemned on contradictory charges? Nothing better, certainly, than the sign of contradiction, which is the cross. So he's given the cross at the foot of the steps of Pilate's temple. And many, many times in his earthly life, he had pulpits. Peter's bark pushed into the sea, the golden gate of the temple, the crowded streets of Jericho with a rich banker hanging on a branch. Now he's given another pulpit. And what a majestic one it is the cross. And he carries it up to Calvary and once there extends his hands to his executioners. Those hands from which the world graces flow. The first dull knock of the hammer is heard in silence. Blow follows blow and is faintly re-echoed from the city walls beneath. Mary and John hold their ears. The sound is unendurable. The echo sounded as another stroke. And then the cross is lifted slowly off the ground, wavers for a moment in midair, and then with a thud, falls into the ground. The divine preacher has mounted his pulpit for the last time. Like all preachers, he o'erlooks his audience. Way off in the distance, he can see the gilded roof of the temple reflecting its rays against the sun, which is soon to hide its face in shame. 
Here and there on the temple walls, he can catch the glimpses of figures straining their eyes to catch the last view of him whom the darkness knew not. And there were soldiers shaking dice for the garments of a god. And there at the foot of the cross was that broken flower, that wounded thing. Magdalene, forgiven because she loved much. And there with a face like a cast molded out of love was John. And there, God pity her, his own mother, Mary Magdalene John. Innocence, penitence, and priesthood. The three types of souls forever to be found beneath the cross of Christ. When men are dying, they ask for pardon. He pardoned. He uttered the high priestly prayer. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is not wisdom that saves, it is ignorance. If they knew what they were doing when they nailed the Son of God to the cross and still went on doing it, they would never be saved. If we knew what we were doing when we've abused the graces of our priesthood and still went on doing it, we would never be saved. Why, we would be damned! It is only the ignorance of what we are doing that brings us within the pale of the hearing of the cry, Father, forgive, for they know not what they do. Then the two thieves curse and swear. One is saved, the other is rejected. And English poet Sidney Carter has written a poem about the conversation of the two thieves, deferring to Christ in the middle. And one of the thieves speaking says, It was on a Friday morning that they took me from the cell and I saw they had a carpenter to crucify as well. You can blame it on Pilate. You can blame it on the Jews. You can blame it on the devil. It's God that I accuse. It's God they ought to crucify. Instead of you and me, I said to the carpenter hanging on the tree. Now, Barabbas was a killer, and they let Barabbas go. But you're being crucified for nothing here below. But God is up in heaven and he doesn't do a thing with a million angels watching and they never move a wing. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. I said to the carpenter hanging on the tree. And it was God they crucified. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Then we come to a sixth word from the cross. It is finished. The word in Greek has the root telos, teleological, that is to say, it is perfected. Let it be, it is finished. Are his sufferings finished? Let us see. St. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, a letter which he wrote from prison, said, it is now my happiness to suffer for you. 
This is my way of helping to complete in my poor human nature the full tale of Christ's affliction still to be endured for the sake of his body, which is the church. And let me read that over. Our Lord said it is finished. Paul says it is not finished. This is my way of helping to complete in my poor human flesh the full tale of Christ's afflictions still to be endured for the sake of his body, which is the church. Certainly, the sufferings of our blessed Lord were finished in him as the head of the church, but they are not finished in his body. The quota of the physical Christ is finished. The quota of the mystical Christ is not. So St. Paul says, I am helping to fill up that quota. Here I am in prison, suffering many stripes, and I rejoice because I can complete this quota. And so Christ's wounds are eternally fresh. They're all over the world. They're in those who have the faith, and they are in those that who do not have the faith. And this vision will come to us as we live close to the cross and meditate on the passion of our blessed Lord. Nothing so much gives us an understanding of the love of God, a sacrificial love, as God coming down to this world from heavenly headquarters and saying, I will take the pain as my own. This vicarious love is the agape love of Christianity. And many people, I say, who know him not, are nevertheless part of that great crimson cord. In Elie Wiesel's book on Auschwitz, there is the story of a hanging. I saw three gallows rearing up in the assembly place, three black crows. Roll calls, Nazis all around, machine guns trained. Three victims in chains, one of them a sad-eyed angel. The Nazis seem more preoccupied and disturbed than usual. To hang a boy in front of thousands of spectators was no light matter. The three victims mounted the chairs. Three next were placed at the same moment in their nooses. The two adults cried, long live liberty. But the child was silent. Someone behind me said, where's God? Where is he? There's a sign from the head of the camp that three chairs tipped over. Total silence. Then the march began. The two adults were no longer alive. Their tongues hung swollen, blue-tinged. But the third rope was still moving, being so light, the child was still alive. For more than half an hour he stayed there, struggling between life and death, dying in slow agony under our eyes. And we had to look him full in the face. He was still alive when I passed in front of him. His tongue was red. His eyes were not yet glazed. And behind me I heard that same man asking, Where is God now? Where is he? There he is, hanging on the gallows. Yes, in Auschwitz. The eternal freshness of the wounds of Christ. No wonder then. St. John tells us about the Lamb. 
the lamb with the marks of slaughter upon him. And if Christ is in agony until the end of the world, and he is, then our vision changes. The passion is not a past history like the Battle of Waterloo. So maybe we better change our lives to be more closely linked with the lamb who has the marks of slaughter upon him. Hast thou no scar? No hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archers, spent, leaned me against a tree to die, and rent by a ravening beast that compassed me, I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound? No scar? Yet, as the master, shall the servant be. And pierced are the feet that follow me. But thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound or scar? You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now continue with the program... Your Life is Worth Living, hosted by Al Smith. Well, Radio Maria family, our hour has come to a close, and I want to thank you for joining me to listen uh, to these powerful reflections given by the Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Uh, The enduring freshness of the wounds of Christ, let us continue to thank our good Lord for his passion and that he continues to show us that You know, we will have scars just like he does if we follow him. And so let us be encouraged by our good Lord's passion that he loves us so much that he died on the cross to redeem us of our sins. And so until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you kindly and bring you peace. You have been listening to Your Life is Worth Living, hosted by Al Smith, here on Radio Maria Canada.